thanks for the opportunity to be here this afternoon. I don't know. I may need to talk with the uh, program chairs about following a travel log of Alaska with the Texas Panhandle. It's a little bit different area. But contrary to popular belief, the High Plains of Texas is not always as flat as a board. Uh, there are a lot of river drainages, and they form complex geological areas in which they're isolated by riparian habitats that are crucial for wildlife and cattle production. Uh, this photo illustrates what would be called a natural state along the Canadian River. This is in the northern part of the Texas Panhandle, where small patches of native cottonwoods, willows, junipers, and very grasses and flowers. But unfortunately, many areas are not as ecologically healthy. This aerial photo was taken north of Border, Texas in uh, 2012, and the dominant plant here is salt seed. All of this uh, vegetation here is salt cedar, and it extends for miles up and down the river. Today, I want to talk about our salt cedar biological control program and the events that occurred in 2012 in the last summer, which may the capstone to a project which began in 2003 to control salt cedar and two important uh, river drainages in the Texas Panhandle. Our original research centered on the Canadian River, which is uh, and primarily the Meredith uh, National Recreation Area. And this map also shows some of the other rivers and streams that are in the area. The Canadian is the primary river coming to the Panhandle, uh, but just south of it, and rivers that are tributaries to the Red River. And uh, this is a map showing more of the red. The Canadian would be up here, and then all of this is drained into the Red River. It comes down here and forms part of the border with uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma and Texas. And the area I'll talk about today extends really from the northern Texas panhandle down to about Wichita Falls, so roughly this area here. Our program in Amarillo has been involved with salt cedar biological control since around 2003, when we started surveys for potential release sites in the Panhandle. Uh, the Euro's Bureau of Reclamation was interested in establishing the beetles in areas such as Lake Meredith, northeast of Amarillo, that had salt cedar problems. We made our first releases in 2004 at sites selected by the Bureau of Reclamation, the National Park Service, and the Canadian Municipal Water Authority. And they manage uh, the use of water from Lake Meredith to 22 High Plains communities, including Amarillo and Northern Texas. Uh, these sites were not necessarily the best because they were targets for herbicide application and controlled burns. And in fact, the burn mania eventually caught up with us. This is our Mullinaw Crossing site. This was the very first site where we released beetles. And uh, it was burned, and uh, there was not much vegetation left other than some kosher. And re sprouting salt cedar. Although this wasn't great for our biocontrol program, we did make the most of it. Uh, in addition to salt cedar biocontrol, we've been monitoring vegetation cover and carabin beetles for a number of years at this site. So we continue to do that to complement the salt cedar project and record differences in ground beetle species diversity in salt cedar infested, uninfested, and burned habitats. But we went ahead and developed new diorama release sites along Lake Meredith and the Canadian River. This is a Google Earth view of our remote sites. Amarillo would be to the south in this picture. Uh, this is our original site at Mono Crossing, uh, where we released a diorama in Omega, the Posini ecotype. Tom Creek, where we have released a diorama of Green and Blue, which you can, uh, you can try again, diorama in Omega, Green ecotype. Uh, up here at the Jones Ranch at our Huber sites, uh, diorama Carabata. So we've made a number of different uh, releases uh, over time uh, along the Canadian River, both uh, east and west of the dam. This is a chronological history of uh, our releases. Uh, at the top here are our releases of Diamond and Omega. As you can see, we started out with relatively low numbers of releases. We started out with a big egg release, but I think we had a lot of mortality there. And, uh, over time, some relatively small releases until we got up to 2010. And we started making some uh, very large releases 
They can be a lot of infestations in Eastwood, Texas. Um, um, sites in uh, Cobb County were made by uh, Chip Lutheran and his troop at the Texas Parks, Parks and Wildlife Management, Wildlife Management Area, and the rest were made by our program. Although, Karimi uh, uh, is the primary species established in Colorado, it is not established in our area at this time. Established at Lake Meredith in the large releases in 2010 made him responsible for this. Previous numbers were much smaller. Uh, we not, do not believe that our diarabed uh, carinated releases at Lake Meredith uh, were responsible for establishment of the species in the eastern canyon. We made one release in Palo Duro Canyon in, in 2007 of 1900 adults. Um, and they may have played a role in uh, establishing carinated in the eastern, eastern panhandle. Uh, one thing that that makes us think that may be possible is that after we got this release established in the cage, we had a flash flood that carried the cage and the beetles and everything else down our downtown park, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And that may have helped get them down uh, into the Red River drainage. But we're pretty sure that these releases that were made in Cabo County, although they were relatively small, probably had some influences in getting uh, Carinata established in the eastern Panhandle. Up until the summer of 2012, our release site at Plum Creek on Lake Meredith was our success story. It's a relatively small area, uh, and this aerial view shows the establishment of the Elongata. This is the creek ecotype uh, that started in 2010 at Plum Creek, and you can see we're getting some affiliation here. And a ground level view of Plum Creek affiliation caused by the Elongata. I uh, put this slide in almost every presentation I give on uh, salt cedar biocontrol because this uh, uh, paper produced by James Tracy and Tom Robbins is kind of key to a lot of the work we do. At first, as if you've been working with salt cedar biocontrol, most you know we thought we only had one species, Diarabia elongata, uh, and then we had various epitypes uh, based on the areas where they were collected. However, this was not the case. Uh, Tracy and Roberts determined that we were dealing with five species of diarabia, not just diarabia elon data. And this is a monumental work, and if it had been published earlier, it could have saved a lot of headaches in the bowel control program overall. In the paper that they did in Zotaxa, James researched the biogeographical requirements of due to diarabia. These are updated uh, climate matching maps that indicate that uh, diarabia carinata were best adapted to our area, and carinulata moderately so. It seems that Jane's predictions were pretty good with uh, carinata exploding across the panhandle. In addition, carinulata is a success story in the Great Basin and Rocky Mountain areas, while elongata and sublineata are working well in other parts of Texas. It really remains to be seen if our establishment of elongata, a creek equal type, I think Meredith can hold on. Uh, but this is a good area for more research, especially in the future, uh, if these species collide with one another. So 2012 started off as a pretty routine year for us. Uh, we had the Plum Creek site to monitor, and we were considering redistribution to other uh, large salt cedar infestations along the Canadian. And the publicity was pretty good. We had some TV interviews and newspaper interviews. Uh, and they were pretty well done by mid June. And then things changed rather dramatically. At Bynum, who is the extension entomologist at Amarillo, received a phone call from Chris Knox, a rancher south of Clarendon, Texas, who said he had beetles on his salt cedar. When we visited the ranch on June 26th and found a large infestation of diarabia on most of his property along Mulberry Creek. The same day, we took a look at the Prairie Dog Town Fork of the Red about 10 miles further south and found most of the salt cedar along the river near Texas Highway 70 um, to be defoliated and large numbers of diarrhea were there in all stages. We collected specimens and sent them to James Tracy for identification and he confirmed that they were all diarrhea for Carinata on uh, July 9th. We were also quite surprised to find Coniatus splendidulus, the splendid tamarisk weevil at the site. This was the first recovery of the weevil in the Texas Panhandle. 
and over the next month we visited numerous sites in the eastern panhandle part of Texas and found by a rabbit at all locations. Uh, a little bit bigger Google map, this is uh, again like we already put here, Emerald, and uh, the pins show the various places where it had to be recovered by uh, Diarabna. This is our establishment of Elongata at Lake Meredith. And then the yellow pins, uh, this is uh, in early June, or excuse me, mid June, of uh, the places we were finding uh, Caravana. This is the Knox Ranch that we have been called to. And uh, this is the point of town fork of the wind, and where we had found uh, large numbers of diamond and also coniatus. This is a satellite view of uh, the Knox Ranch, uh, Sand Creek, and Mulberry Creek, where we were finding diamond. Uh, this is uh, center pivot irrigated pastures with uh, salt cedar along this drainage. It, this is uh, relatively uh, dry, intermittent streams. Uh, with a few springs scattered here and there. This is the period on John Fork of the Red, where we had found uh, coniatus. And just a few pictures of this area. This is Chris Knox and uh, some of his salt cedar that's infested with uh, Diarabda and my crew sampling at the Knox Ranch. Both salt cedars at Knox Ranch and uh, this infestation and all the infestations we found in the southeast pound handle were determined to be diarabna crinulata by James Tracy. And this is a picture of the prairie dog town fork of the red. We do get into some rather long uh, stream titles in Texas and some of the defoliation uh, that we found in that area in July in June. And for those of you who have not seen it, this is Coniata Spud Digilis. This is the Spud and Cameras people. In very, very tiny little bits, like the very colorful. Kind of interesting uh, uh, pupil case, and you can see the larva inside this basket. Now, we also had success in Oklahoma. Uh, since the summer of 2010, as most of you know, there's been a moratorium on transporting diorabed across state lines. Uh, the story behind the moratorium is too long to detail today. But suffice it to say that it is uh, illegal to transport beetles from Texas to Oklahoma, even if they're separated by just a shallow river. But nature kind of worked its, uh, this out on its own. Tom Royer, who's an extension entomologist with Oklahoma State University, and I surveyed the Texas-Oklahoma border in uh, July of last summer and found Iranda, Carinata, and Harmon County. Uh, this is a picture of Tom and a good I ran the Carinata infestation at Esteban, Texas, and success in Oklahoma came up a little bit earlier that day. So this table summarizes the recoveries we made in 2012. A good number of the beetles for counties in which diorama was recovered were hybrids of uh, Carinata and Elongata. We can say, however, that diorama species were recovered in 19 uh, Texas and five Oklahoma counties and Coniatus recovered in three Texas counties in 2012. Because of the size of the geographic area we were dealing with, we decided to do an aerial survey of the Canadian and Prairie Dog Town Fork of the Red in mid-July. This is an aerial view of the diorama infestation at the Prairie Dog Town Fork of the Red and Texas Highway 70. This is the Knox Ranch would be up that way. This is that uh, ranch where we are we started finding these large numbers of diorama, and you can see the defoliation is pretty intense in a lot of areas along the river. And this is an aerial view of uh, the diorama infestation along the very known town fork of the red at Estelin uh, along U.S. Highway 287, and this is looking southwest. Although this flight was pretty informative, uh, we really need a more sophisticated approach if we are to collect uh, hard data on the extent and the intensity of the infestation. It's really easy to see uh, when diorabs are attacking the salt cedars, as, as you probably know. But um, we're going to try and find a better way of getting uh, some mapping done of this so we can find out the total acres that have been uh, infested with diorabs. So, uh, this slide uh, shows on the left places where Carinata had been found in the summer of 2012, all the way down uh, Cottle County. This is the 
we have a little wildlife management area you know, along these various river drainages. This is our release site uh, at Lake Nerds and Plum Creek. And then over the summer, we took density estimates of, of the of infestations we were finding, and it seems that they were a lot heavier in the southeast than they were up in the north and in the central part of the panhandle. But these were taken over about a month's period of time, and we were probably sampling on multiple generations. And uh, we're going to monitor these sites a lot more closely this coming summer, and we'll be ahead of the game. This caught us by surprise being in, in uh, mid-June when we started to find out that the beetles were around. But we'll know, we know about it now. We can be out there early. We can get the uh, first generation coming out of overwintering and be able to record it through the summer. So this is the distribution of diraptor species in eastern Texas Panhandle and western Oklahoma at the end of 2012. Uh, this was the general distribution in counties uh, in the eastern Panhandle. We had five counties in Oklahoma, or excuse me, seven counties in Oklahoma where the beetle had been picked up, uh, and then all of these counties. Some of them were, uh, we have the one place where we had pure elongata, um, a number of places where we had uh, pure carinata, but then we also had mixes of uh, uh, carinata and uh, uh, elongata hybrids in various counties also. We, I mentioned a little bit about the hybrids. Uh, one of the things that we're interested in is how what's, what's going to happen with these hybrids. Uh, Right now, we don't know where all these carinata came from. They could have come from that releases made at the Matador Wildlife Management Area, but those are relatively small numbers of beetles. They could have come from the beetles uh, flooded down the Prairie Dog Town Fork of the Red from our releases, but again, that wasn't a huge amount of beetles. Uh, so we're kind of uh, in a quandary as to where they came from, why they all of a sudden exploded in the eastern panhandle this last summer. Uh, We've been taking samples, and other researchers in Texas have been sending samples to James Tracy, and he uses a uh, morphometric key to determine the percentage of hybridization between elongata and caridata. And uh, this map is from uh, James's work, and uh, the, the circle shows the rough percentage of, uh, of the hybridization. Down here you have these uh, circles that are completely yellow are all elongata, and if they are all green, it is all carinata. Our one site up here at Lake Meredith kind of stands out on its own. But you can see that there's a, a mix of hybridization, especially as you get into the uh, southeastern part of the Panhandle and then on down further into Texas. And as you get to this side, you're getting quite a bit more carinata, or excuse me, elongata, and up in here. Sure. Data. So we're still a little bit mystified as to what's going on. Uh, we want to look at this a lot more closely. And uh, since James has a really good technique for determining the amount of hybridization, um, we may be able to backtrack this somewhat. We believe that maybe some of the uh, releases that were originally made may not have been pure species. They may have been hybrids to begin with. And that may be a reason why we're seeing this. As to what that's going to uh, what impact it may have on the program if the hybrids will be better at defoliating or if they're better, uh, have better reproduction or worse reproduction. There seems to be some indication that it depends on which, uh, which side is more hybridized. If you have, for, let's say, uh, a higher percentage of the hybridization is from the elongated side, it may be not as fit as if it comes from the carinated side but that hasn't really been decided yet. So for the future, uh, we will continue to monitor the spread of the beetles and assess salt cedar biocontrol. On the research side, we're still working on how the riparian systems change as salt cedar is removed. The good thing is that we now have a pretty big canvas on which we can work. We can compare salt cedar infested, salt cedar free, and sites where biological, chemical, and fire control has been used. We're very interested in what may happen when Diarabda, Elongata, and Carinata collide uh, naturally around northern Texas along the Canadian. 
It should be very interesting on field laboratory for potential hybridization. And finally, there is a cooperative effort being developed to look at salt seeder management and light of yields and other control measures. Uh, hopefully, future funding will allow this work to occur. And this would be for management in Oklahoma and Texas. And I believe that's the end of it. And if I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for Jerry? We have one. Don't go anywhere yet, Jerry. Okay. So, are there are there any potential uh, consequences of hybridization? You know, some issues that weren't looked at when you started with this. I mean, you know, you're going to have the questions. So, how are you responding to that? Well, okay. I guess one of the reasons why it wasn't asked to begin with is that we originally didn't know that we had five separate species. Everybody thought it was diarrhea elongata, and then it was it was a subspecies um, lizard tacoma. But we didn't know we had the five separate species until James had done his work. Once we knew that, Dave Thompson from New Mexico State University had uh, started doing work crossing the different uh, species to see if hybridization would occur. And I, I, if, I guess he was using, I guess he was using all five species. I'm not really sure. But uh, he was finding that some, and it depended on which males you cross with which females, and some were lethal and some were okay. Or they'd have different effects. You could have like less um, uh, egg production, or you could have that um, the larvae would develop so far and then not emerge, let's say, from the pupa. So there were a lot of mixed results. But at least in, in the panhandle and into Oklahoma, it seems now that we're down to two species um, that can hybridize. But it also seems that the hybridization, it, it, isn't, it isn't something that's going to be lethal or we would be finding this number of beetles. Because the, the infestations that we were finding last summer uh, in the eastern panhandle were massive. There'd be just thousands upon thousands of beetles on these trees. So it looks like we finally kind of uh, gotten over the hump. But, uh, probably enough beetles are out there in, the, in that area now that they've exceeded uh, predation pressure. And... Uh, Probably spread out far enough north to south that if we get like a late season freeze, it isn't going to be wiping out the initial infestation. So we're hoping that the hybrids may end up being stronger than uh, the separate species. It, it could be a benefit. Thank you. <laughs>